So the festivals, the ways in which the Greeks worship their gods in big festivals. Now, of course, you could have very local festivals at the sort of deem level, at the lowest sort of civic community grouping, and there were lots of those. But at the same time, you would then have festivals happening at the civic, often polis level, and then you would have festivals which we might want to call kind of pan-Hellenic, which all Greeks ascribe to. So lots and lots of festivals taking up lots and lots of days of the calendar. In fact, it's quite surprising that the Greeks in some ways found time to do anything else because if they were doing all the festivals that were asked of them uh, it wouldn't leave time for much else going on. But we're going to focus in on two specific festivals which happen at the civic polis level, so the kind of intermediary level. And many of you have asked first about the Panathenaea as a festival and particularly some of you have asked was it more about religion than it was about the city? Now this is a great question because obviously as we've tried to uh, help describe the nature of Greek religion, Greek religion is inevitably always also simultaneously about the city and its citizens as much as it's about worshipping the gods. The two are really indivisible from one another and what I want to do is offer a description of the Panathenaea to show how different aspects of that festival perhaps prioritised uh, civic pride and civic showing off frankly and civic organisation and civic hierarchy and how others uh, prioritised ensuring that the gods were kept on side. But fundamentally the Panathenaea, the all Athenian festival, was about ensuring that the city of Athens as a whole had a good relationship with the gods and particularly with the goddess Athena, their deity, after which the city had been named, who supposedly once upon a time, of course, had won the contest against Poseidon to be the patron deity of the city of Athens. So this was about the city as a whole ensuring its good relationship with the god. And they did that, of course, by worshipping and by celebrating a massive festival in her honour to get her goodwill. Now, of course, a part of that, perhaps the most important part of that, in terms of its religious aspect, was the development, the creation of a new robe, a peplos, for the statue of the goddess Athena that stood within the temple of Athena Polias or somewhere else on the Acropolis at different points in time during the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, uh, which was processed in a very flamboyant, totally over-the-top procession up to the Acropolis to adorn this very old, supposedly still wooden cult statue of Athena. That was the gift that the city was creating and giving to her. But in doing so, as they were processing up from the boundaries of the city, from the gates of the city, from the area known as the Keramikos, which was also the graveyard of the city, outside the city walls, the potter's quarter, where they made all those fantastic vases and drinking cups for the symposium, uh, uh, from that quarter where they assembled for the Panathenaea, then following a very specific route, the Panathenaic Way, that proceeded through the Agora and then up the Acropolis to the Temple of Athena. And the, when they did that procession, it was, as you can imagine, a massive civic sight to behold. The city turned out to watch itself, or representatives of itself, processing through the city in order to honour their patron deity. And there was a very specific order in which the procession moved, for example. So you knew from where you stood in the, pre in the procession what kind of value uh, and place you had in the civic hierarchy of the polis of Athens. Uh, and people watching the procession could see very visibly that hierarchy as well. Uh, but it also was showing off the wealth of Athens. So there was a massive number of animals that were driven up the Acropolis along the Panathenaic Way and then up the Acropolis that were then going to be sacrificed to the goddess Athena. Now, these animals, on the one hand, were an offering to the goddess to get her goodwill, so it's religious. But obviously, the city, in being able to uh, bring together, feed, nourish, and, and mature that number of animals and then sacrifice them all at once, was making a certain demonstration about its wealth and power. And it was also, crucially, creating a massive barbecue where the meat uh, of the animals, which the gods supposedly didn't like, that meat could then be distributed to all its citizens. So this was a chance for the city to also 
show its generosity to all its citizens. And some calculations of the amount of meat that was created from the sacrifice of these hundred or so animals works out at about half a pound of good meat for every Athenian citizen in the fifth century. Right? This was a massive payday, barbecue payday, for the entire Athenian citizen body, as well as, simultaneously, showing off the wealth of the city, as well as, simultaneously, uh, showing off kind of how much goodwill they were trying to earn from the goddess. And of course, the Parthenae was not just a procession with a religious sacrifice and offering to the, to the goddess Athena. It was also a chance to, to host games, athletic and musical competitions. Uh, and here, people co would come from all over the place to compete, and the winners would be given prizes. Very special amphorae, panathenaic amphorae as they're known, with images on them of people engaging in different types of athletic competition, which would be filled with uh, olive oil, prized high grade olive oil that was produced from specific olive oil tree fields that the Athenians maintained uh, for this sole purpose. So what again we have here, we have a set of athletic and musical competitions that are in honour of the goddess. Hopefully she will be pleased and show magnificence and benevolence towards Athens. But we also have an occasion where people are coming from all over the Greek world to partake in these games and as a result make Athens the centre of that world. And we have an experience in which the Athenians are showing their wealth in that they can have entire fields of olive trees dedicated solely to producing olive oil for the prizes for these games, that they can produce the prizes for these games, and that they can offer them uh, as a sort of gesture to the winners from coming all over the Greek world. And there's a further kind of aspect to those games that we need to think about, which is that might strike you as something that might be done at, say, the Olympic Games or the Pythian Games at Delphi. Um, and you're absolutely right that the Athenians, with their Panathenaea, were desperate for their Panathenaic festival and Panathenaic Games to be thought of as being on the same level as the great Panhellenic Games of Olympia, Delphi, Isthmia, and Nemea. Now, the Panathenaic Games never quite made it into what we know as the Crown Games festivals, the, uh, the magic four, the major four of Delphi, Olympia, Isthmian, and Amir, despite Athens trying every trick in the book to make that possible. So we can see again that the Athenians were desperate to get their civic festival, as much as it was about honouring the goddess, into the major premier league of Greek festivals, um, and they never quite managed it. So we've talked a little bit about how the Panathenaea is both simultaneously something for the goddess, but also something for the city, uh, and, some, and, a, and a way in which the city can both show off to the outside world, reconfirm its hierarchy, and at the same time offer something to its citizens in the form of meat to actually eat and enjoy altogether. And one of my favourite thoughts about Greek festivals is the quote of Aristophanes that the major after effect of a Greek religious festival was indigestion because everyone was absolutely stuffed. Let's move the conversation on to think about the mysteries at Eleusis, and particularly you've been asking the question of how much were the mysteries at Eleusis about civic unity? And again, really interesting question, kind of around the same point of how much the religion and politics overlap. Now, the Eleusinian mysteries were a very odd case. It is a mystery cult. We don't know exactly what happened within the bounds of the sanctuary of Demeter and Chorea at Eleusis. Um, but it was fundamentally one in which people could be initiated who came from very, very different backgrounds. This was not a case of you had to be an Athenian citizen. It could actually be from anywhere across the whole of Greece. You didn't even have to just be a man. You could be a man or a woman. Women could equally be initiated into the cult at Eleusis. So could slaves. Right? The only things you, that stopped you from being initiated into the cult of mysteries at Eleusis were if you couldn't speak Greek, so if you were outside the Greek world, or if you'd committed murder. Those are the only two things that stopped you from being initiated. So the group that met to be initiated at the cult of Eleusis was a really odd one, composed of foreigners as well as Athenians. Um, foreigners, I mean people from outside of Athens and equally from outside of mainland Greece, as long as they could speak Greek. Men and women, slave and free. It was a very odd group that would not be seen in any other context within the Athenian religious or civic political calendar. Right? So people came together in a way they didn't come together for any other event, really, in the Greek world. Um, and equally, um, Athens did try to make this festival uh, uh, an issue to do with the polis. 
because the Eleusinian mysteries, despite being a, a mystery cult, were part of the kind of official Athenian polis level sacred calendar. And in fact, preparations for the mysteries of Eleusis began in the center of Athens at the Agora, where all the initiates gathered. And then they uh, did a few initial rituals kind of in and around the, the center of Athens and then processed in a big public procession, not unlike the Panathenaea, from the center of Athens all the way the 15 miles or so outside of Athens to Eleusis, where they then, the initiates, disappeared inside um, the sanctuary to be initiated. So in some ways, it feels like a very polis level, civic um, engineered or civic kind of orientated event, uh, despite the fact that the group going through it was unlike any other civic gathering um, in the Athenian calendar. And equally, I think there at that point, the civic, um, what they were hoping to gain on a civic level from the, uh, the mystery cult of the Lutus sort of ended. Because what we know about the mystery cults is that it, it sort of promised three things. Um, it promised you an emotional experience, a massively emotional experience. It promised that you didn't necessarily learn something new, but that you experienced something new. And as a result, felt changed in your life as you went about the rest of your life. And thirdly, that it promised you, having been initiated, a different fate in the afterlife. So the things you, the initiates got out of the mystery cult of Eleusis, apart from being scared out of their wits, uh, were a sense that they, as a group, a very odd group of people, kind of were changed and different from everyone else. And I think, on the one hand, scholars tend to underemphasize the degree to which that group would feel that they had some kind of group identity after that, even though. You know, they went off to their very different um, civic uh, roles after that, as men, as women, as slaves, as Athenians, non-Athenians. But equally, most importantly, they all felt that they had a different afterlife uh, or a different fate waiting for them in the afterlife rather than in their current lives. So to sum up about the mystery cults at Eleusis and the degree to which they're to do with civic unity, I think they brought together a group of people unlike any other moment in the Athenian uh, civic or sacred calendar. I think that they uh, then promised certain very individual things to those people, particularly vis-a-vis -vis their afterlife. Uh, and at the same time, I think that it did give that group a certain sense of group identity that they would have remembered. Uh, but at the same time, kind of actually, it also allowed the Athenian state to show another festival uh, in which it was uh, responsible for maintaining, running, uh, organizing, uh, and uh, broadcasting to the world the importance of this mystery cult. Um, and the Athenians, as ever, were brilliant at propaganda and about pushing their advantage. And the Athenians realized, as a city-state, as a polis, that they could really market the mystery cult at Eleusis. And they did this through the archaic, the classical, the Hellenistic, and even well into the Roman period of Greek history. Um, they made sure, for instance, when the uh, mystery cult was happening, that a truce amongst all groups and, uh, and, and communities who wanted to send people to be initiated had to be sworn. So they, again, they were trying to make their Eleusinian mysteries sound a bit like the Olympics with the Olympic truce. Um, and they used the occasion of the mysteries as uh, a moment to demand from Greek city-states across the whole of Greece an offering to Demeter um, that should be sent to conveniently be stored at the sanctuary at Eleusis, which the Athenians controlled. So the Athenians were never, never missed a trick to make this festival about them as a polis and about their importance as a polis, but actually for the people who were being initiated, it was uh, something much more to do with their individual fates than it was to do uh, with the city itself.